Welcome to section 10.14. So general people, note that I am not covering section 10.13 or section 10.12. You are not responsible for the material in there. You guys are welcome to take a look if you're interested in thermodynamic processes. But let's go ahead and cover section 10.14. So what I want to talk about is something called the adiabatic process. Now the adiabatic process is a process where no heat is coming in or out of our system. So in other words, Q is going to equal zero. So here's the idea, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to have a gas and around this gas is this super insulator in green. Now I'm going to run through a process and what's going to happen is it's still going to be in this super insulator in green. So the process that I'm depicting in this picture, state one to state two, is I'm doing an expansion process. Now what you have to note in an adiabatic process is that pressure, volume, and temperature are going to change once you get to your new state. Now we've never done this before. All the processes that we've talked about thus far, we've always kept one thing constant, either pressure, volume, or temperature. Now in this case, all three of them are changing, and we'll go ahead and see how we do these calculations. Before we get into that, let's go ahead and talk about the consequence of having Q equal to zero. Well, I know my internal energy equals Q plus W, and if Q is zero, well then my internal energy is going to equal W, my work. And so this is true for an adiabatic process. And the take home message here is that in an adiabatic process, the work that my system is doing is coming from the thermal energy of my system. And so that means I'm going to get a temperature change as I do this work. Now you guys can go ahead and look at the derivation for equations, but this is the equation that is in your equation sheet. And that is that the pressure one times the volume one raised to the gamma equals pressure two times a volume two raised to the gamma. Now gamma is gonna equal CP over CV. So let's go ahead and practice this out. I want you to go ahead and look at example 10.16. Once you run through this problem, go ahead and mark the right answer. All right, gentle people, what I want you guys to remember is that in an adiabatic process going from state one to state two, pressure, volume, and temperature are all changing. So we're gonna use this equation when we have an adiabatic process. The first thing is let's go ahead and talk about gamma. So gamma equals CP over CV. So in this problem, I gave you a monoatomic gas. And so a monoatomic gas, CP is five halves R, and CV is three halves R. So in this case, for a monoatomic gas, gamma is gonna equal five thirds. Now the next thing I wanna do is I wanna try to get the temperature in each state. Now remember, we have a monoatomic ideal gas, and so we can go ahead and use the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. So let's go ahead and try to get some data about each one of these things in each one of these states. So the first thing I wanna do is calculate V1, and I know based off the ideal gas law, that that's going to equal N R T1 over P1. So I can go ahead and put the values that were given in my problem. I have five moles of gas. The R that I want to use is 0 0.08206 liter ATMs over Kelvin mole. Now I wanna put the temperature, I was given 25 degrees Celsius, so let's put that into Kelvin, which is 298 Kelvin. And I wanna divide this by the initial pressure, 
and in this case my initial pressure was 10 atms. Now with all this data I can go ahead and calculate V1 and V1 happens to be 12.23 liters. Now that I have volume one, we are ready to use this formula for the adiabatic process. So my pressure is 10 atms. I just calculated my volume, 12.23, and we also calculated our gamma, 5 thirds. Now this is going to equal my pressure, and I'm going to one atm. I wanna go ahead and solve for my volume. And again, this is raised to the gamma of 5 thirds. So we can do some calculations out. This is gonna be 649.2, and that's gonna equal V2 to the 5 thirds. Solving for V2 gets me 48.69 liters. Now what I can do is, again, I can use my ideal gas law. T2, or the, or the temperature in the second state, is going to equal P2 V2 over NR. And so now I can put in all this data. Again, I'm going to 1 atm. I just calculated my volume. I still have 5 moles of gas and my R constant, I can go ahead and plug in. This gets me the final temperature of my system at 118.7 Kelvin. Now with this all done, I can finally try to answer my question. What I wanna do is I wanna know what the work of my system is. Now in an adiabatic process, work equals the change in my internal energy. The change in my internal energy is going to equal NCV delta T. So remember, this is another equation on your equation sheet. So let's go ahead and plug in these values. I have five moles of gas, and since it's a monoatomic ideal gas, that's going to be three halves R, or three halves 8.3145 joules per Kelvin per mole. Now I'm gonna do my delta T. This is gonna be my final temperature, which I just calculated out, minus my initial temperature, which was given. If I go ahead and run through this calculation, I get this as the amount of joules of work that I performed. All right, gentle people, I wanna close out chapter 10. The last thing I want to talk about is how spontaneity relates to how civilization developed. What you guys will note is that when you study history, they talk about things like the Copper Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and so forth. And what you'll note is that this kind of parallels the kind of chemical reactions that humans could make spontaneous. So if you have a simple campfire, what you can do is chuck in copper ore, a little bit of carbon, and you can smelt out pure copper. And so this is spontaneous with my campfire. A little bit later, what humans figured out is if we add a little bit of tin ore, we can go ahead and put our carbon in and we can smelt tin out. Now copper plus tin, well that gets us bronze and this gets us our bronze age and again, we can do this spontaneously in a campfire. Now we can't do this with iron. It isn't till much later where we get blast furnaces. Now, once we get blast furnaces and we get hotter temperatures, well, we can go ahead and take iron ore, combine it with carbon, and we can smelt iron out. And so now what I need to do is I need to increase my temperature to get this reaction to be spontaneous. And that's why it took humans a little bit longer to get here. Now we are in what's called the aluminum age. To smelt aluminum, well, I need to raise the temperature to some obnoxious temperature. Now we'll see how we got around this and, and how we don't actually smelt aluminum through a fire. We use another process, which we'll talk about in chapter 11. 
Well, I hope all this material made sense in chapter 10 and remember to stay safe, Chem 1B.